Listen to a conversation between a student and a university administrator. Hi, I'm Robert West. We had an appointment. You're here about your graduation form, right? I'm about to print it out. Oh, good. Thanks. I was kind of wondering what it's all about. I mean, I've completed more than enough coursework to graduate. Oh, this is strictly routine. Of course, you have to finish your coursework, but this form is just an administrative checklist. It's our way of making sure you don't have any unfinished university business, like um, unpaid tuition bills or lab fees, that sort of thing. Well, I do have an outstanding student loan, but I was told that I don't have to start paying that off yet, not till I get a job. I do have a job interview tomorrow. Well, good luck with it. But no, your loan's not at issue here. Let's see. The only problem I see is, um, hmm, what's this fine for? Uh, an overdue CD that you borrowed from the music library? Really? I, I checked that out like three months ago, but it wasn't really for me. Oh, you checked it out for a friend? No, uh, for a faculty member, actually. Uh, we needed the music for a play we produced. Uh, Professor Williams was our director, and I was in the show. Anyway, he had asked me to borrow the recording from the library. Okay, but that still doesn't explain why you didn't return it. Well, he ended up with it. He said he'd return it, and I just assumed that was that, because I never heard anything from the library. Well, that's odd. Usually they send you a notice. Yeah. Oh, but I did recently move to a new apartment. Maybe they did send something. Okay, well, this should have been done in a timely manner, but as they say, better late than never. If you return the CD now, you'll get away with just a late fine, which is a lot less than the fee to replace it. Yeah, but it's totally not my fault. So now I have to track down the CD to avoid having to pay this replacement fee? Well, yes. I mean, it sounds like there was some kind of a mix-up, but the burden's still on you to settle your library account. You know, it, it might be that their records are wrong, so first I suggest you go there and make sure. And then you might have to go talk to Professor Williams. <sighs> I guess I have no choice. Don't worry too much. These things always get sorted out. Yeah, you're right. It's no big thing. I should be more worried about my job interview than about this. And when it's all worked out, come back here for your paperwork. Why does the student go to see the woman? What is the student's problem? Who is Professor Williams? What is the most likely reason the student did not receive the notice from the library? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. 
first, I suggest you go there and make sure. And then you might have to go talk to Professor Williams. <sighs> I guess I have no choice. What can be inferred about the student when he says this? I guess I have no choice. Listen to part of a lecture in a geology class. So, we've talked about the plates that form the Earth's crust and their movements and how in some places they're separating. Now, when this happens in the ocean, along a mid-ocean ridge, uh, some important things can happen. In particular, you can get a hydrothermal vent. This is a lot like a geyser, except it's on the ocean floor. A geyser, of course, is a kind of eruption from an underground hot spring. The water that's been heated up in the Earth's interior, uh, uh, when under pressure, uh, can erupt, sending that water and steam shooting upwards through a crack in the Earth. A hydrothermal vent is essentially the same thing, but the water is emitted out of cracks or, uh, or fractures in the ocean floor. If you've heard about hydrothermal vents at all, it's probably because of the exotic life forms around them. Uh, tube worms, giant clams, that kind of thing. Forms that don't depend on energy from the sun, but depend on chemical energy. But the vents are also of enormous significance for us, from a purely geological perspective, uh, because the the chemistry of the oceans is affected by them. Uh, to see how, uh, let's look at the process a little more closely. They typically occur in fields, so you might have an area with a dozen of them. But you need two things to get one of these fields. First, you've got to have heat. And you've got to have fissures in the ocean floor. So in a vent field, you've got cracks in the ocean floor and cold water at the bottom of the ocean, uh, we're talking maybe two degrees Celsius, goes down into them. As it goes underground, it heats up because in these fields, there are magma chambers only a few kilometers below the ocean floor. This hot molten rock heats the solid rock above it to as high as 500 degrees Celsius. And this heated solid rock then heats the ocean water that flows over it. Now, remember, the high pressure of the deep sea allows water to stay liquid at such a high temperature. So it can reach temperatures of three or 400 degrees Celsius. As the water is heated, it rises up through other cracks and it shoots up back into the ocean, much like with geysers on land. Now, the important part is what the water is carrying with it as it emerges. Uh, the heated water draws minerals from solid rock. So you've got dissolved metals in the water, like iron and copper. When the water shoots up and re-enters the cold ocean, it quickly cools and these minerals precipitate out. Uh, they're released and they're deposited into the ocean water which affects its composition. And it also creates quite a sight. These vents have a plume that looks like smoke, um, like smoke that's coming up out of the vent in the earth. Uh, remember, uh, some of the water coming out of the vents is over 300 degrees Celsius. And when it's this hot, it dissolves sulfur, iron, and other metals in the rocks it interacts with. When these minerals precipitate out, the water forms a black plume. So these vents are called black smokers. It's the sulfur and metals precipitating out of the water that, uh, well, that's what causes the black color. 
But there are also white smokers. Uh, these emit what looks like a white smoke. That's because their water is relatively cool. Well, about 100 to 300 degrees, uh, still pretty warm, but not warm enough to dissolve sulfur or iron. Instead, they draw off different minerals from rocks, uh, things like silica, and they give off a different color, a whitish color, when those minerals precipitate out. But in both black and white smokers, as the water is emitted in the plume, the minerals that precipitate out eventually build up around the vent, forming large tower-like structures or minerals built up layer upon layer. We call these chimneys, just like a chimney on a house. Different minerals will tend to build up at different places on the chimneys, but some of the minerals, like silica, form a kind of cement. Um, and it holds the whole structure together so they can grow quite large and quite quickly. If you can believe it, there was one chimney that reached 47 meters. That's like a 14-story building. It collapsed, but it's actually now rebuilding. What does the professor mainly discuss? According to the professor, what is the main difference between geysers and hydrothermal vents? What aspect of hydrothermal vents is of most significance to the professor? What conditions are needed for hydrothermal vents to form? What are two differences between black smokers and white smokers? What does the professor say about the chimney structures that grow around hydrothermal vents?
Listen to part of a lecture in an art class. Okay, your next assignment will be to draw your surroundings. But before you all go out to find something to draw, and before I explain why I asked you to bring in cameras today, uh, let's talk about how you're communicating in your artwork. You know you're communicating if you're getting viewers to respond, right? Making them feel and think. I mean, isn't that your goal, to get your audience to respond? So then, what do people respond to in a work of art? Uh, it seems to me it's usually, um, well, it's something really personal an artist has expressed, something the artist cares about deeply. If you really care about, say, uh, a place or an idea, chances are that you can make others really care about it, too. So, to generate a reaction, the, the art you create needs to communicate a concept, a, a feeling. In other words, create art that reveals your own experience. Uh, for example, I drew a picture of my son. He's five, and, and he's looking at a horse. And in that picture, I wanted to capture my son's reaction, but also the horse's reaction. The idea was to convey their, uh, not fear exactly, but, but their discomfort with each other. Should they run, fight, make friends? I wanted the drawing to capture that pivotal moment when you don't know what they'll do next. And, you know, when that drawing's been shown in galleries, people have made all sorts of comments on it. They find it, uh, well, it really seems to speak to them. So... A strong work of art creates a strong viewer response. And to create a powerful work of art, you, you have to show how, how, uh, how the world affects you. So you need to expand your powers of observation to, to really look at your surroundings. Uh, but you can't just be like a tourist. Uh, what I mean by that is tourists observe, but they, they have or may have no emotional involvement. But you need to be involved. Strong artists look at their surroundings and find something personal there. Like every day when you, you wake up and step outside, some people think, uh, oh, it's just the same old thing. But if you're really paying attention, you'll see something special, something intriguing, even in the most ordinary environment. Of course, if being a strong artist means expressing your own views, your own perspective, well, that means uh, that you have to know something about who you are. Um, failing to know yourself, well, that invites misconceptions about your art. Viewers will have trouble identifying what part of your art reflects you and, and what reflects the experiences or, or the ideas of other people. Which leads me to a problem students sometimes have in this course. Lots of times, when I tell students to go out and draw their surroundings, they tend to want to use the latest new technique to, to draw, well, the way everyone else is drawing, uh, whatever is the most popular style, or, or they try to copy the style of a famous artist, or, and I see this a lot, they try to copy my style because I'm the teacher. That's not what I want you to do. I'm suggesting, actually, let me put this more emphatically, you need to spend time exploring, understanding your own view of the world. Once you do, a personal style will naturally develop. I'm not saying that to become a good artist uh, that you shouldn't learn about the work of other artists or, or that you can't improve your technique by taking classes. You should do both of those things, but, but frankly, more than anything else, if you're really going to communicate anything in your art, you have to know yourself and how you respond to the world around you. But enough lecturing. I'm, I'm sure you've already learned in this class that I can get pretty passionate about what it takes to be an artist. Anyway, let's talk about today's assignment. Here's the exercise I want you to try. It's a very concrete technique that'll help you become more aware of your surroundings. And here's where the cameras come in. 
You know, photographs are a great way to generate ideas for a drawing. You take photos of your surroundings, people, objects, scenes like uh, children playing soccer in a schoolyard or, or a lonely bench in a park. Then, as you examine your photos, you look for the elements that triggered those personal feelings that made you take the picture in the first place. And you can take those features and use them in a drawing that reflects your, your, your personal artistic vision. By the way, instead of copying those elements exactly, I encourage you to draw them your own way in the style that works for you, abstract or realistic. Remember, this isn't about copying. It's about interpreting the world around you from your unique perspective. So, grab your cameras and let's go. What aspect of drawing is the talk mainly about? Why does the professor discuss a drawing of his son? When the professor talks about tourists, what point is he making about artists? What does the professor strongly encourage his students to do in order to become better artists? Why does the professor want students to use cameras in a class exercise? Why does the professor say this? But enough lecturing. I'm, I'm sure you've already learned in this class that I can get pretty passionate about what it takes to be an artist. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor.
I'm going to suggest you rewrite this paper, Ron. That bad, huh? Actually, not bad at all. Your paper's very well written, but it has a major problem, one that we need to talk about. Okay. The novel you wrote about, The Wide Sargasso Sea, you know that's based on another novel, right? Yeah, it's based on Jane Eyre. Right. So, why didn't you discuss Jane Eyre in your paper? Well, I've never read Jane Eyre, but I also think that The Wide Sargasso Sea can stand on its own. I don't think anyone would dispute that. Jean Reese is a wonderful author, and if you were just reading the book for fun, but if you want to write an academic paper on this book, well, I don't think you can do that without acknowledging Jane Eyre. I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, because really, isn't every book that's ever been written influenced by other books? So, like, it's difficult to know where to draw the line. But we're not talking about subtle influences in this case. The issue here is a very concrete case of one writer basing her book directly on another book, and a very famous one at that. But Jean Rhys didn't just rewrite Jane Eyre, did she? If you'd read Jane Eyre, you'd know that what Rhys did was, in a sense, she reinvented it by writing it from the point of view of a secondary character in Jane Eyre. Antoinette, the main character that you wrote so much about in your paper, She's just a minor character in Jane Eyre, someone we hear about but hardly ever see. So, do you think that Reese would have written The Wide Sargasso Sea if Jane Eyre had never been written? I don't know. I mean, I saw a lot of parallels between Antoinette and Jean Reese. They were both born in the West Indies, and then they moved to England as young women. Maybe Reese would have written a similar book anyway. Then why didn't she just base Antoinette on her own life? Why use a character someone else invented? And isn't there more to the setting than just where the author happens to come from? Don't you think there's more to the fact that Jane Eyre takes place in England, but the wide Sargasso Sea is mostly set in Jamaica? It's just that I already work so hard, and my schedule is so tight. Now I wish I'd scheduled a conference with you before I started my paper. Well, I hold those conferences for a reason. Look, what you wrote is good. It's very thoughtful. You make some really original points, and I guess that's why I'd like to see you take another stab at this. Right now you'll get an okay grade, but I think if you just read Jane Eyre, you could write something really special. At least think about it. Okay, but reading another book and rewriting the paper, even if I can find the time, I'm not sure I've got anything creative left to say. Why does the professor criticize the man's efforts on an assignment? What is the man's initial reaction to the professor's criticism? The professor suggests that the student failed to discuss an important fact about the main character, Antoinette, in the Wide Sargasso Sea. What fact was it? Why does the professor discuss the setting of the wide Sargasso Sea?
What does the man imply about rewriting his paper? Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. Okay, so we've seen some examples of animals whose vision is very different from our own. Now I'd like to play around with this idea. An animal's visual perception, the way it sees the world, has a profound effect on the way it behaves. And when we try to understand the behavior of an animal whose perception is different from ours, we're interpreting their behavior from our perspective. And for that reason, some of our current thinking about animal behavior, theories which have not taken perceptual differences into account, may be biased. So before we get started, who can remind us of some of these differences? Yes, Jack. Well, last week we talked about insects with compound eyes and, well, I remember this picture in the book that showed you how each eye was actually seeing hundreds of images of an object when we'd see only one. I'm glad you brought up that example because the animal I want to discuss today also has compound eyes and that's the fiddler crab. The fiddler crab has been studied quite a bit by researchers interested in this connection between perception and behavior. One reason is that it's quite easy to observe. It lives out in the open on mud flats and has a very limited territory. In fact, it rarely leaves this mud environment. Now, the fiddler crab has an unusual way of seeing. As you'll notice from this picture, its eyes are located on stalks that point straight up. This gives the crab a panoramic visual field. Here, let me show you what I mean. So the fiddler crab can see 360 degrees all around in every direction. And the end of each stalk is divided into about 10,000 little eyes. So it has compound vision, similar to what some insects have. Another unusual feature is that this crab's vision is sharpest on the periphery on the outer edges of its visual field. Now, actually, this makes a lot more sense when you realize that it's on the edge of its visual field, on the ground where the other crabs are likely to be, that they have to make the finest distinctions, like between rival and mate. But even the sharpest part of the crab's visual field isn't all that great. It'd be like, oh, Imagine looking at a newspaper and say you saw nothing but a blurry white object, maybe with a few black spots on it, okay? Now, another important thing animals have to be able to see is predators. For fiddler crabs, the most important predators are typically birds. And the very center of the fiddler crab's field of vision is, surprise, the sky. And here's the thing. The crab's visual field is even blurrier in the center, up in the sky, than it is on the edges. But that doesn't make sense. If the center of the crab's visual field is so blurry, then how can they ever defend themselves? I mean, how do you know they wouldn't mistake, I don't know, something, anything, in the air for a bird? Well, this goes back to what I said earlier. We need to stop thinking from our own visual perspective and think about it from the animal's point of view. Because everything it sees is blurry, the fiddler crab's worldview is a very simple one. Everything in the sky is assumed to be a predator, and everything on the ground is assumed to be a crab. This is the most basic distinction it needs to make for its survival. So what for us would be a disadvantage, blurry vision, actually turns out for the crab to be an advantage to its survival. This way of seeing simplifies the way the crab needs to respond to whatever it sees. But how can we know that for sure? Actually, researchers have proven it. Here's what they did. They placed a cylinder on a mud flat inhabited by fiddler crabs. The crabs treated the object like another crab, fighting it, ignoring it, or even sizing it up as a potential mate. 
But when the same cylinder was tossed up in the air over the mudflats, all the crabs ran for the safety of their burrows. So you can see how the crab's behavior is affected by its vision. An object on the ground, any object, as long as it's on the periphery of its visual field, is perceived as another crab. And that same object, when seen in the air, at the center of its visual field, is perceived as not a crab, and therefore a potential predator. What is the purpose of the lecture? What feature does the professor describe as being common to both an insect and a fiddler crab? According to the professor, what detail about the fiddler crab makes it easy to observe? According to the professor, what is the most important distinction that a fiddler crab must make? How would a fiddler crab react to a ball thrown in the sky above it? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now, another important thing animals have to be able to see is predators. For fiddler crabs, the most important predators are typically birds. And the very center of the fiddler crab's field of vision is, surprise, the sky. What does the professor imply when she says this? And the very center of the fiddler crab's field of vision is, surprise the sky.